Let's pray. Actually, let's read first, and then we'll pray. We are uh, covering Joshua 13 tonight. Um, 13 and 14 are a lot of kind of dividing up the land. Actually, 13 starts a new kind of a new section of Joshua uh, for several chapters. It's the dividing of the land, but there's a couple cool nuggets that we can take at it, and that's what I'm going to try to pull that out. Uh, Lord, uh, as he, as he is want to do, uh, anytime I'm prepared and something to teach, he's always teaching me first and reminding me of things I need to be uh, cognizant of and, and areas that I'm falling down. And so this is not a, at all, this teaching is not, not a, it's a, so uh, there's, there's some, there's some, uh, Good stuff in this chapter. Let's uh, read. Now, Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old, advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. This is a land that yet remains all the territory of the Philistines and all that of the Jeshurites, from Sihor, which is east of Egypt, as far as the border of Ekron northward, which is counted as Canaanite. The five lords of the Philistines, the Gazites, the Ashdodites, the Ashkelonites, the Gittites, the Ekronites, also the Avites from the south, all the land of the Canaanites and the Maara that belongs to the Sidonians as far as the Aphek, to the border of the Amorites, the land of the Gibalites and all Lebanon towards the sunrise from Baal God below Mount Hermon as far as the entrance to Hamath. All the inhabitants of the mountains from Lebanon as far as the book as the brook Misrafoth, excuse me, Misrafoth, and all the Sidonians. Them I will drive out from before the children of Israel, only divide it. By lot to Israel as an inheritance, as I have commanded you. Now, therefore, divide this land as an inheritance to the nine tribes and half tribe of Manasseh. With the other half tribe, the Reubenites and the Gadites received their inheritance, which Moses has given them beyond the Jordan eastward, as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had given them. From Aror, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and the town that is in the midst of the ravine, and all the plain of Medeba, as far as Debon, all the city of, cities of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon as far as the border of the children of Am Ammon, Gilead, and the border of the Jeshurites and the Machathites, all Mount Hermon, and all Bashan, as far as Salka, all the kingdom of Og, and Bashan, who reigned in and Ashtaroth, and Ed, Edrei, who re, remained of the remnant of the giants, for Moses had defeated and cast out these. Nevertheless, the children of Israel did not drive out the Jeshurites or the Maacathites, but the Jeshurites and the Maacathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. Only in the tribe of Levi he had given no inheritance. The sacrifices of the Lord God of Israel made by fire are their inheritance, as he said to them. And Moses had given to the tribe of the children of Reuben an inheritance according to their families. Their territory was from Orar, which is on the bank of the river Arnon, and the city that is in the midst of the ravine, and all the plain of Medeba, Heshbon, and all its cities that are in the plain, Debon, Bamoth, Baal, Beth Baal, Meon, Jahazah, Kedemoth, Mephaoth, Kirjam, Kirjathaim, Sibma, Zareth, Shahar, in the mountain of the valley, Beth Peor, the slopes of Pisgah, and Beth Jeshimoth, all the cities of the plain, all the kingdom of Sihon, king of the Amorites, who reigned in Heshbon, whom Moses had struck with the princes of Median, Evi, or Evi, Rakim, Zur, Hur, Reba, all were princes of Sihon dwelling in the country. The children of Israel also killed with the sword Balaam, the son of Beor, the soothsayer, among whose those who were killed by them. And the border of the children 
of Reuben was the bank of the Jordan. This was the inheritance of the children of Reuben, according to their families, the cities, and their villages. Moses also had given an inheritance to the tribe of Gad, to the children of Gad, according to their families. Their territory was Jazir, and all the cities of Gilead, and half of the land of the Ammonites, as far as Eror, which is before Reba, and from Heshbon to Ramath, Mizpah and Betanim, and from Mahanaim to the border of Debir, and in the valley Beth Haram, Beth Nimrah, Sukkoth, Zaphon, the rest of the kingdom of Sihon, king of Heshbon, with the Jordan as its border, as far as the edge of the Sea of Chinnereth, on the other side of the Jordan eastward. This is the inheritance of the children of Gad, according to their families, the cities, and their villages. Moses also had given an inheritance to half the tribe of Manasseh. It was for half the tribe of the children of Manasseh, according to their families. Their territory was from Manaim, all Bashan, all the kingdom of Og, king of Bashan, and all the towns of Jair, which are in Bashan, sixty cities. Half of Gilead, Ashtaroth, Edri, cities of the kingdom of Og in Bashan, were for the children of Machir, the son of Manasseh, for half the children of Machir, according to their families. These are the areas which Moses had distributed as an inheritance in the plains of Moab on the other side of the Jordan by Jericho eastward. But to the tribe of Levi, Moses had given no inheritance. The Lord God of Israel was their inheritance, as he had said to them. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for uh, these men. I thank you, God, for uh, your word. I pray, Lord, that um, you instruct us, you rebuke us, Lord, that you um, correct us, that we, we may be perfect men uh, based on this scripture that uh, seemingly doesn't have um, much in it. And I just pray, Lord, that you would uh, reveal yourself, reveal your son Jesus, and, and God... I just pray, Lord, a blessing over this time, God, that we might grow out of this, uh, that you would be glorified in it. Oh, Lord, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Um, so this is obviously kind of a hearkening back to what had happened with Gad and uh, half the tribe of Manasseh and... Um, uh, Reubenites wanting to stay on the other side of the river. River uh, They'd been given, he's kind of describing that land. It's essentially from that, that whole stretch of the River Jordan up to the, uh, the Sea of Chinaroth to the, down to the, um, what's that land below? What's the, what's the Dead Sea, thank you. So it's the Dead Sea down here, Sea of Chinaroth up here. On the east side of the river there, he had, he had divided that land up, up for uh, these two and a half tribes. And that's kind of where that's the bulk of this chapter is where that is. Uh, we're going to kick off in verse 1. Now Joshua was old, advanced in years, and the Lord said to him, You are old, advanced in years. <laughs> Captain Obvious, thank you, Lord. I knew that. We are old and advanced in years, and there remains very much land yet to be possessed. And the first thing, honestly, that came to my mind when I read that, preparing for this, was my conversations with Mike of, <laughs> yes, you've, obtained, you've done much painting, but there's still much painting left to do. <laughs> so, I feel old and advanced in years, and yet Mike still says, there's more painting to do. So, so we're, <laughs> we're getting there. <laughs> go and paint no more. <laughs> there, there, there will be a day where I'm going to go and paint no more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> will be. <laughs> right. But I, Honest to goodness, that was the first thing I thought of when I, honest to goodness, the first thing I thought of when I read that is there's, yeah, there's much painting left to do. But anyway, 
You are old and advanced in years. So, so this is not, this is, uh, for this time frame, he's not particularly old. Uh, he's, um, there's some debate on how old he is, but he's, he's expected to not have gotten past 110 which is certainly old, but it's not for this time frame, was not exceptionally old. The point was, as opposed to, say, Caleb, as opposed to, say, Moses, who walked with the Lord, they were old, but they weren't really worn out. The, 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 the damage of the years had not happened to their bodies as much. Caleb was just strong as he was when a young man. Moses was, uh, was very strong as though he had not aged, he had aged chronologically, but hadn't aged physically and all that goes with that. So this is kind of the idea. Joshua had aged. This, 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 uh, he, had, he had gotten old and he had, he had, the, the years had gotten to him. And there yet remained much to be possessed. And, and I guess uh, the point I want to make out of this that, that I think we have a tendency uh, I know I have a tendency to desire to rest on laurels to, uh, uh-oh. Hey, by the way, my, my dad obviously doesn't approve. That's right. So the, um, that's right, that's right. Um, I think there's a tendency in, in our walk with Christ to, to want to get to a point where there's not more battles to be had, where there's not more land to be uh, possessed, where there's not more areas of our heart that we need to, I don't want to fight that battle anymore. And I, and I think that's a tendency in us that, that we want to get to where we're done. But we're not done until we're done, right? And so, and so, um, yes. he just slammed the door on Bruce. Mr. Bruce. Um, and I think, I'm just going to read Ephesians 6.10, uh, just kind of at a, as a reminder of that, um, starting at 6.10, I should say. Uh, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand. And having done all to stand, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. It is not a coincidence or just a neat picture that Paul gives us of dressing for battle. Um, and against our desires and wishes, we have to remember that there is a battle to, to wage. And we can, we can sit on the sideline and pretend there's not a battle going on, but there is. There's a battle going on. And if we're not advancing, the reality is, is we're falling back. That's a reality in my life as much as it is in your life, is if we're not actively advancing, we're falling back and we're losing ground. And we need to remember that we are in that battle and there remains yet very much land to possess. This was told to Joshua even at the, the end here for him. And there, there remains very much land for us to possess in our, in our hearts, very much, very much uh, work that we must do internally and much work we must do externally. 
Uh, some of us are still obviously relatively young, um, but we don't know when that last day is. We don't know. God doesn't give us that, that warning typically of when that last day is. And so um, just think about the, what, what things have you left undone? What, what has the Lord given you that you've yet, yet to possess? Uh, what areas, what people has he placed in front of you that you yet to, to go to with the gospel? Uh, some of us are, are a bit further along in our twilight years, possibly. Uh, and I just want to encourage you to keep battling. There, there's going to be a day when you stand in front of the Lord and you want to hear. And I want to hear that well done, my good and faithful servant from Matthew. And we want to hear that. We want to. That's not something that, that you know, whew, we just barely got there. And I, I, I know there, there's, there's times where you are tired and worn out, and I'm tired and worn out. Mike, thank you. And, <laughs> and the, but I'm just messing with Mike, obviously. Um, but there are times that you feel like resting on your laurels. But don't. Get back in the battle. Get, make sure you're in that battle each day, every day. Is there anything you've left undone? Um, is there any territory in the heart, in your heart, that you haven't claimed yet? Is there any uh, friends, loved ones you haven't shared the gospel with yet? Is, is there... Um, I'm just going to go to the life lesson. Be, be thankful to the Lord for what he has accomplished in your life and continue to battle until all the territory he has given you has been claimed. The Lord gave us a new heart. Have you claimed that completely? Are there areas, there are corners of your heart that you still allow uh, to be covetous, that you still allow to lust, which are kind of both the same sins in different directions, that you allow unthankfulness, that you allow unforgiveness. Um, to allow idol worship. I guarantee you there are. <laughs> I'm not. There are some areas in my heart that I, for, there's certainly that, that, that um, the Lord continues to reveal to me that I've, I've got to I've got to peel that out. I've got to not allow that to be uh, given over to the world, given over to the thoughts of the world. Be thankful to the Lord for what he has accomplished in your life and continue to battle until all the territory he has given you has been claimed. Do you live in the fact that you are righteous in Christ? Do you truly live that? Do you understand that that work is done? That's, that's, a, that's a territory God has given you that you are righteous, period. Not you will be, you might be. You are righteous as it stands, as you stand before God, you're righteous in Christ. Do you claim that? Do you live that? Do you still have areas in your heart that you um, take pride in when you do something X, Y, Z? Well, I get up and get in the Word 25 times a day, and I... You know, and you should. I'm not. We should. Or do you get ashamed? I haven't been in the Word for a while. The Lord has, the Lord has done that work in you. What, whatever that thing you take pride in, whatever that thing that drops you to shame. If you have put your hope in Christ, the Lord has done that work. Yeah, get up and and. Get in the Word. Get up and do what you're supposed to do. Stop doing whatever you're not supposed to do. Stop taking pride in, in, in the things that you're patting your side. Well, I do this better than other people do. That's for sure. And there's some of that in each of us that we tend to look around and we compare ourselves to, I mean, I don't compare myself to Harry because he's like here, but, you know, to other people. But there's a reality there that we have a tendency to either take pride in the areas that we haven't surrendered to the fact that God has claimed that righteousness for us or we can heap up shame on ourselves when we fall 
and not remember that God has claimed that righteousness for us. And it's not because of us doing the perfect thing. It's because of his goodness. So claim that gift. Um, 2 Timothy 4. Actually, I've got it right here. I don't need to turn to it. 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearance. And here is Joshua. He has run a good race. He... He you know, was an instrumental helper to Moses. He was one of the 12 who went to the land and came back and said, God said, take it, let's do this. He didn't look at the giants and he didn't look at the difficult terrain and he didn't look at all the difficult things. He looked at God and said, God said, take it. And he's big and they're not. And we can do this because God said, take it. And so this is the kind of life he lit, lived, and he's, he's a, a man of war, led them into uh, taking possession of much of the land already. And so here he is. He can, he can say this. I've, I've fought the good fight. I've done it. I've finished Joshua. I've finished my race. Each one of us want to be able to say this. I, I want to be able to say this, that I, fought, that I finished the race. I tend to be transparently, I'm a good starter. I'm not a great finisher. It's a reality of life for me. And so I have to be aware of, A, what do I start? I need to make sure I finish that because I have a tendency to start a lot of things that I, no way to even finish all of them. But as, as, as a weakness in my own character, finishing is hard for me. I may want to, I desire to, I have good intentions, but it's, there becomes a point where it's a, you're battling now to finish. And that's what life, sometimes life is. You must battle to finish the race you've started. We must battle to finish the race you've started. I've kept the faith. Joshua can say that. We're going to jump to verse 8 here. Um, and I'm not going to read that whole section again, but this is basically talking about the verse eight on is talking about uh, the land that God had given to, or that Moses, God had given to um, the children of Gad, the children of Manasseh, half the tribe of Manasseh, and the children of uh, Reuben. And I guess my my what I wanted to bring out of this is you don't hear much about those two and a half tribes through the rest of scripture. They just kind of fade away. And, um, and I think that's, that's a warning to us of life on the fringe, life outside of uh, the center of God's will, his presence and his people. We have a tendency to sometimes want to separate ourselves. That's, that's, the enemy uses that constantly to build a wall. It's either easier or there's some reason to build a wall or whatever, but we tend to try, we don't try to, but the, the enemy brings up reasons in our heart to divide ourselves from others, divide ourselves from believers, keep ourselves from being connected in a church, keep ourselves from uh, being committed to that church. And so I ask, what level is your commitment to Jesus? To, first of all, I mean, do you believe in him? I, mean, I think pretty much everybody in here is a pretty solid believer. But do you really talk about that? Do other people know about that? Is that just what you do on Sunday and Thursday and whatever else Tuesday that you're here? Is that something that everybody knows about in your life? I know it's personal. Don't think about personal things. But it's not personal. It is uh, eternal. To the church, what's your commitment level to the church? You go? Are you mostly outside looking in? And I'm not talking about physically outside, or are you, are you emotionally not really connected in what's going on? 
There's, and there there'll be times and seasons where you're more connected, more committed, less connected, less. And that's, but we need to be aware of those in our own heart. Where where are we? And God calls us to be committed to His people, committed to the work that He's doing. And we're down here. It's easy to look out and blame and find 20 different reasons why we're here. But the problem is our heart has allowed things to get in the way of us being committed to his, his people and his work, uh, what he's doing in our local uh, area. Do you look for what's wrong rather than trying to do what is right in the body? That's easy. I am a expert in walking into my home and pointing out 20 things that are wrong. It's, it takes an effort to walk into my home and then and make sure I encourage rather than just whack everybody with my cynical nature and, and irritated tongue. And, the, and it's, it can easily be that way in church. We can walk around and we can look at everything that everybody does and that we don't like, and or we can do something good. And there's going to be things that we don't necessarily like here. That's just the way it is. But God has called us to be committed to one another. To the Word. What's, what's your commitment to the Word? Is it foundational in what you believe? If you come across something in Scripture that is... Um, that you don't agree with, do you change what you, what you believe? That says a lot for what you really believe of, of, is this God's word. If this is God's word and I, and I come in conflict with God's word, guess what's supposed to change? Me. I'm supposed to change. Not explaining away why this maybe isn't true, but I'm supposed to change. What about when you come across something that you don't understand in Scripture or find hard to resolve? Do you blame Scripture? Do you somehow, uh, does it lower your view of Scripture or do you recognize it's a, an issue with your understanding? And these are, these are just foundational questions of, of what it, do you, is this the Word of God? There's no mistake here. There's no, uh, God, doesn't, God didn't um, leave us more or less than what he intended to leave us but we do certainly have holes in our understanding there's and there's lots of them if, and if you don't come to that recognition and that and that level of humility that i man i don't understand this but it's not because something's wrong with the word it's because i don't understand this and there's a lot of that you can you know calvinism armenianism I mean, you, you can throw out a hundred different polar, polar views of different things within Scripture or, or whatever. And the fact is, is we're not going to come to a perfect understanding of many of those different points of theology. But God calls us to be committed uh, to His Son, committed to the church, uh, and honor the Word. And so I guess a couple things, if we, if we recall what, what happened here with these guys later on uh, in Joshua, is they built an altar. Um, and they built an altar so that the other Israelites would remember, you know, in further, further generations, we want them to know that we're part of you. We're not going to be a part of you. We're not going to go worship where you worship. We're not going to live with you. But I've got my Christian shirt on. And see, that says that I'm Christian, or I've got my cross tattoo, or I've got my external altar of whatever that shows that I'm a Christian. Got my, what's the cool, the, my now sticker on my not of this world sticker on my car, or whatever Christian thing that we tend to build up, or that we tend to externally place for people to recognize that we're, we're them. But do we, 
Are we allowing that, that work to be done in our heart? Are we, are we still separating ourselves on the fringe, just doing barely Christian things? Or are we a part of the group in the, in the presence of the Lord, allowing the door, Lord to do work in us? Life lesson, there's nothing wrong with the external signs of your faith in Jesus, but others should know without them that you belong to Jesus. Again, there is nothing wrong with external signs of your faith in Jesus, but others should know without them that you belong to Jesus. It should, In other words, it shouldn't be a shock to people when you show up in a shirt that's got a cross on it or something. What? You? <laughs> right. <laughs> right? It's just, it should be just something that you enjoy as opposed to this is how I'm telling the world. Um, okay, so in Joshua, and I mentioned it, Joshua 22, 11 through 31, it goes through that whole uh, process of, of how they had separated themselves. And, and it appears if you look uh, in the story of Matthew 8, uh, where Jesus crosses over uh, to the Gadarenes, Gadarenes, who... Um, we're on the other side of the lake. He crosses over to them and they want Jesus to go away. They don't want him to be there. They've messed up their pig farm. What on earth are children of Israel? Why do they have a pig farm? And he st they still don't want the presence of the Lord with them. Jesus, you go away. <laughs> right? So this, here we see early on here in, in Joshua that that sin... Of, of that separation from the presence of God, that separation from the people, a separation of the ways of the church has led now on for hundreds of years to these people who are functionally not even Jewish any longer. We need to be aware of that with our with our with the following generations. What are we what what seemingly small things are we introducing into our lives? That is, that is telling our following generations, this part, it's okay to play with this part of the world. It's okay to be separated from the church in this way. It's okay to not set ourselves apart from the rest of the world. So what ways do we tell our, our children that, or y those younger in the faith that? The more you separate yourself from the presence of God, this is a life lesson, the more you separate yourself from the presence of God and the people of God, the more likely you are to allow the world to occupy your heart. Read that again. The more you separate yourself from the presence of God and the people of God, the more likely you are to allow the world to occupy your heart. Let's jump down to verse 13 real quick. Nevertheless, the children of Israel did not drive out the Jeshurites or the Maacathites, but the Jeshurites and the Maacathites dwell among the Israelites until this day. They were tribes of people on the east side of the Jordan that, that lived in the land that was given to the Gadites and the uh, half-tribe of Manasseh and the Reubenites. And they did not drive them out. And that became, that becomes in us, as we see also those who were on the other side of the Jordan, those parts of the world that we do not drive out from us will ultimately cause us major problems. And I think if there's any, anything that I, um, that we, as a body of Christ, as, as our fellowship, that, that uh, when I look around that we tend to do is we do a lot of um, movie watching, TV watching, and stuff of the world that, man, that stuff is garbage. It is garbage. It is garbage. Ephesians 5.11, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Uh, 
if you aren't shocked when you turn on a TV or watch a movie, you should take some time away from it. Allow the Lord to, to uh, clean some of that mess out and then watch it again. And you'll, you'll be shocked at the mess that, that's being shown, even stuff that, that you wouldn't think. I've gone back at this point and, and watched some old shows that I used to watch when I was younger that thought nothing about them when I was younger. Now it's like, holy cow, what they were pushing. And you'd be aware that, that um, they, they are trying to turn your heart away from the Lord. That goes for movies, that goes TVs, that's books, that's porn, that's news, that's all sorts of stuff that we need to be careful what message, what worldly message they're pushing. Now we're not saved by doing or not doing these things but we surely can be lost to them. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, for uh, the warnings. I thank you, Lord, for the uh, reminders, God, that um, we should use our time well, that we should continue the battle to possess, Lord, the, the areas in our lives that you have claimed, the uh, the circles of influence that you have claimed. Lord, help us to use our lives well for that. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, for um, just the insight it gives us into, into who we are, into where we are. And I pray, God, for each of these men, Lord, that you give them a wisdom and understanding of where they are personally, the areas, God, that, that you want to change in them, that you uh, see needs fixing in them. And I pray, Lord, that you would encourage them in the areas, God, that you have done great work. God, I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.